Hey guys, it's Mr. Kennedy back with another video, and this one is on animal behavior. Now, animal behavior is basically anything an animal does, such as this little fiddler crab down here. Uh, the fiddler crab is waving its big claw up in the air, but realize that when it does a behavior, it has some outcome that it's trying to get out of the behavior or the, or the action that it does. Waving, the, waving its big claw serves as two purposes for this little fiddler crab. Number one, if he's got a great big claw, he may scare away other filler crabs and keep them from coming into his burrow. Um, but if he waves it really, really fast, he uses it to attract females. So everything the animals do that we don't really notice might, might actually mean something. Now, behaviors can be solitary, confined to one, or it can be social within a group. It can be fixed, never changes, but it, or it can be variable and always changes. But usually it is linked to either survival or reproduction in some way. One such example of a behavior is a migration. A migration is when the environment triggers for the animals to move. You know, we usually think of birds migrating south for the winter, but realize that the environment not only is triggering the time for them to migrate, but also the environment may trigger for where them where for where they were going. For example, birds may be flying south over areas they've never been to before, but are using the sun as a guide to know where to go. Um, and even within the animal environment sometimes, the circadian rhythm of the animal may direct how it acts, like sleeping in the daytime or being awake at the night or sleeping at night and being awake at the daytime. You know, that's our circadian rhythm, our 24-hour cycle. Now, when we talk about behavior, we have to talk about animal communication. Animal communication usually involves one animal giving a signal, and true communication doesn't take place until another animal actually receives that signal. Now, there are four types of animal communication that I want to talk about. They're visual, which is through sight. You know, color usually is associated with this in animals. There's chemical, which is pheromones, and we've talked about this before. Pheromones are chemical messengers, and think about it with the ants, for example. You know, when ants leave an ant hill, they all leave in a straight line. It's because they're following the pheromone of the ant that found the food. Um, if you erase some of the, the line with your foot or whatever, the ants will get confused. They don't know how to get back home. Uh, it's kind of like Hansel and Gretel left breadcrumbs. Ants leave chemical messengers or pheromones behind. A lot of animals use pheromones for different reasons. Um, tactile would be through touch. And auditory would be the other one. Auditory would be through actual sound, you know, uh, barking, croaking by a frog, or a cricket chirping, for example. I wanted to give you one specific example, waggle dance in bees. And you can see this bee down here, um, this bee here. What it does is it waggles and it points in this direction and then it will circle and waggle again and circle and waggle again and all the other bees watch what it does. Well, there is a reason for this. If you notice, what happens is the bee will use the sun as a guide from the hive and whenever they find food, they will actually put their butt away from the food and walk toward the food, okay? And then they'll come around and they'll waggle and other bees will find it. And they know that if they fly in this direction, they will find food. Now, what if the food is away from the sun? Then they will. he will walk in this direction. And even if the food is off like at a 60 degree angle, they will make a 60 degree angle here and walk in this direction so bees can communicate. It's also been said that the faster they waggle or the slower they waggle to make tells the bees how far to fly out so it's a way they communicate with other workers so that they can find the, the food source now when you talk about types of behavior there are there's innate behavior which is behavior that you're born with you don't have to think about the suckling uh behavior in animals where they know exactly how to feed is usually is an innate behavior these meerkats over here are all on watch this is a born uh an inborn behavior in, in them uh, learn behavior, behavior that you learn. For humans, it's like reading, riding, riding a bicycle, etc. Um, and there's other behaviors you're not born with. Then imprinting, sorry. Then imprinting would be uh, such as Conrad the Wrens. It's a combination of both. Uh, geese or goslings are the best example, or ducks. It's when, whenever they're born, whenever they hatch, the first organism they see, they believe is their mom, and they follow it wherever it goes. Now, realize it's innate because it, they know to follow the organism and they know to keep close, which is a protective mechanism. It's learned because they don't really know what they're imprinting on until they actually see it. So it's a combination of the both. And 
it's a, it usually happens in a sensitive period. Early in early in life is what I mean by sensitive period. Now, this is a very good thing. Conrad Renz found out that he could actually get the geese to follow him around. Uh, there was a movie by Disney, I Fly Away Home, I think it is, where uh, the little girl had to fly south with the, the geese in order to get them to go. Um, but that's an example of imprinting. Now, there's different types of behaviors that I'm going to refer to. The first one is spatial learning. Um, animals are believed to use the environment as spatial clues. An example is this digger walls here. A digger walls, um, they have a burrow in the ground, and whenever they leave, they cover it up with sand. But if you notice them, when they fly off to get food, they'll come back to that exact spot. Well, there was an experiment done in which they put pine cones around the nest, and they noticed that whenever the digger walls flew away, she always returned. One time when she flew away, they moved the pine cones, and she went to the wrong spot. So they realized that animals were using environmental clues to figure out exactly where nests are, food sources are, etc. Um, associative learning is whenever we associate one environmental feature, such as color, with another, bad taste. Uh, example is this blue jay down here. Blue jays realize that if they eat monarch butterflies, it makes them throw up. Usually they don't eat but one. They associate that color of the monarch butterfly with the throwing up. So any other butterfly that looks like a monarch or mimics a the monarch, they're not going to eat. Um, we, we talk about associative learning, it's kind of like classical conditioning. Uh, remember Pavlov, if he, he rang a bell and got the dogs to slobber or slavitate, and he eventually could just ring the bell and they would, they would slavitate without actually seeing food. That's classical condition. They associate a bell with food. You guys associate the bell with leaving class, so that's classical conditioning. Apparent conditioning is trial and error learning. Um, it's done by a set of practices, like, for example, when you ride the bicycle, uh, you realize that if you fall off, it gets hurt, so you try even harder to keep riding the bicycle. Apparent conditioning is actually improved with motivation. You know, if I gave you a million dollars to learn how to ride a bicycle, you would be a lot more motivated to, to go through the trial and error process. Social learning is the next one. This is a type of learning where you learn from other individuals in your group. I've got some monkeys from the island of Koshima here, and researchers started giving them sweet potatoes, to eat and laying them out on the beach. And they realized that one day, one of the monkeys, one of the female monkeys, grabbed a potato, and I mean, it was a sweet potato, sweet potato, and they washed it in the water before they ate it. Um, a few days later, another monkey did the same thing, and another monkey, and now, if you go to the island of Koshima, all the monkeys wash their sweet potato. That's social learning. They're learning from other animals uh, in their group. Uh, another one would be a foraging behavior. A foraging behavior is any behavior in which you are looking for or capturing food in some way, recognizing it. There is called the optimum forage model. Make sure you know this, the optimum forage mo model. It shows that natural selection favors foraging behavior that is the least cost but the most benefit. An example is um, the northwest crow um, and snails. They eat snails out of tide pools, and it's in British Columbia. And the higher up that the the crow carries and it drops the snail onto the rocks, it'll crack it open. Well, snails have figured, I mean, um, crows have figured out if they go up about five meters, that's high enough to break the shell snail, the, the snail shell, um, and they don't waste any energy. Not many crows go eight meters, nine meters, ten meters high because you're wasting energy flying up and to get the same results. And if you go too low, you have to continue to fly up again and again and again until it finally breaks. So, Optimum foraging model shows that they figure out exactly where they get the most benefit with the least amount of work. I think that's like a lot of my students. Um, all right, mating behavior and mating choice. Um, most mating is promiscuous, which means that whenever there, an animal becomes in receptive, another animal that's near takes the, takes the opportunity to mate. So there's no really strong pair bonding here. Now, some relationships are monogamous, which means one male mates with one female for life. And an example would be like an eastern bluebird. I mean, their bond is so strong that if one dies, the other one will set by its side until it passes away as well. Um, some relationships or a lot of animal behavior uh, mating is polygamy or poly, poly, uh, poly, <laughs> polygamy. Uh, an individual of one sex mates with several of the other uh, sex and it's usually one male with many females and examples like a lion and its pride um, now I just want to bring back to your mention what memory what sexual dimorphism is 
And if you hear that term, it just means the extent to which males and females differ in appearance, you know, by color, uh, by size, um, by the way they act, etc. Now, the last thing I want to mention is a thing called altruism. It's a behavior that reduces the animal's individual fitness, but increases the fitness of the individual in the population. Um, an example would be like these ground squirrels. These ground squirrels, whenever they see a hawk coming by, um, they'll go out and give a real loud shriek or squeal to warn all the other ground squirrels that don't realize that the hawk's coming. But realize by doing that, they increase the likelihood that they're going to get eaten themselves. So this is altruism, is selflessness of an individual. Uh, naked mole rats are another example. There's usually one queen that suckles all of the uh, babies of the, the group or of the, the herd here. Um, and she gives up some of her nourishment in order to do that for the population. Bees are another example. Anyway, guys, I hope this helps you, and I will talk to you very soon.